Hey everybody, this is Jerry. Welcome back to the Auto Layout video tutorial series. In this tutorial, you're going to learn about editing constraints. Once you have constraints defined, if you need to iterate on your design or just tweak the layout, you can reset the constraints and start over, or of course, you can just edit what you already have. When you have a view selected, the Size Inspector will show a list of constraints involving that view and a graphical representation of the constraints that you have defined. This is a great place to scan and see all the constraints that are impacting the size and position of a view. From here, you can click on the Edit button and it will show more detail about the constraint parameters and allow you to quickly change them. So if you want to change the trailing space from 30 to 20, you can just click Edit, type in 20, and press Return or click away and it will change. One thing that can be a little confusing before you understand it, if a view is fully constrained with no auto layout warnings or errors on that view, and you change one of the constraints, Interface Builder will assume you want to change the frame as well and changes it for you. But if there are any warnings or errors and you change the same constraint, the frame doesn't update. The Edit button gives you quick access to change the most common parameters of a constraint, but you can also double click on a constraint in the size inspector of a view or just select it in the document outline and the size inspector will show all the details of the constraint. I'll go through these in some detail, but just note that Interface Builder tries to create constraints with a positive constant value. If you mentally think of the bottom of a label as being negative 8 points from the top of a text view, rather than the text view being 8 points more than the bottom of the label, you can tell Interface Builder to switch the order here. It doesn't change how things are laid out. It just allows you to match the constraint with your mental model. Using these fields, you can change all the aspects of a constraint. I'll talk more about some of these, like relation and priority, in a later video tutorial. The important thing here is that it allows you to do some things that you can't do another way. Auto layout will allow you to create constraints between two different attributes of two views, as long as they're in the same direction, vertical or horizontal. You've already seen that you can create a constraint to align the leading edge of two views, or the leading edge of one view to the trailing edge of another. But you can also align the top of one view with the center Y of another view, because they're in the same direction. To create this kind of constraint, first create a constraint between the top of the two views, and then come here and leave the one item as top and change the other item to center Y. I'll explain identifier and placeholder in the demo, but to understand multiplier, let's look a little deeper at constraints. A constraint is calculated using this formula. Attribute 1 is equal to multiplier times attribute 2 plus a constant. When you define a constraint, you're really filling in the pieces of the formula. So when you create a constraint between the text field leading edge and the label trailing edge with a space of 8, you're defining attribute 1 as the text field leading edge, the multiplier is 1, attribute 2 is the label trailing edge, and the constant is 8. If you want to define a view to take up half the height of its super view, you can create an equal height constraint between them and set the multiplier to 0.5. Now, although both multiplier and the constant are defined as float values on NS Layout Constraint, Interface Builder will not let you enter a decimal value for constant, and if you want to enter a decimal value for multiplier that's less than 1, you have to enter it with the leading 0. If you just type 0.5, it won't take it, but 0.5 works, just to make sure you meant it, I guess. If you remember the aspect ratio option we saw before, this is how those are created. The width is just a multiple of the height. Those are the ways you can edit a constraint in Interface Builder at design time. But what if you want to edit a constraint at runtime? Well, once a constraint has been activated on a view, the only thing you can change about it is the constant. But you can create an outlet to the constraint just like you would to a view. Then at runtime, you can change the constant of the constraint. Let's continue with our project from our previous demo and take a look at some of the constraints that we've created. If we open up the size inspector, when I select this text field, it shows a list of all the constraints that I have created on that text field in the size inspector. And it also shows this graphical representation of which constraints are created. So we have a leading space constraint, a trailing space constraint, 
a top and a bottom, and this one represents a baseline. If you click on any of these, it'll filter the list to show just the constraints that apply to that direction. So of course in the baseline direction we only have one, and if I click it again then it changes the filter to, to none. So it shows all the constraints on the list. If I click on the trailing direction, there are several that apply to the trailing direction where we're aligning this field to other fields and also the trailing space to the super view. So it shows me all those trailing space constraints when I filter by just that direction. Let's edit this trailing space to super view constraint. And if I click this edit button, it pops up a quick dialog that lets me edit the most common parameters of the constraint. I also can double click directly on the representation of the constraint itself and it'll show that same dialog. Let's go back to our list. And let's change this, let's say I want more room between this field and the edge of the super view. So I'm gonna change this to 20. And it changed the field in the wrong direction. It added, added 20 points to the width instead of subtracting 20. And the reason is that these constraints are, are in sort of a different direction than my mental model. And we'll fix that in just a second. I can edit quickly any of the parameters of this constraint using that edit button, but I also can double click on the constraint in that list. And now it's showing me the constraint over in the document outline that I've just selected, and it's showing me details in this size inspector of that constraint. And this is where we can reverse that first and second item. So if I just click this and say reverse first and second item, then it'll swap those two. And when it swaps them, it swaps the value to keep the frame the same. So let me just change this back to 20. And now I have the more space that I was expecting between these fields and the edge of the super view. Let's look at the rest of the items in that menu. It shows me other options for each edge of the constraint. The first item, right now we have a constraint to the trailing margin. I can change that here to the leading margin or the center X. It shows me all the options in that same horizontal direction. And it shows me a relative to margin option that's checked. If I wanted this constraint created to the edge of the super view instead of to its margin, I could uncheck that. And respect language direction, I almost always leave that checked. We already looked at reverse first and second item. Now I showed you that in the document outline that it's got this constraint selected as well. Sometimes in the document outline, it's, it's hard to tell which constraint is which, especially like we have here, we've got a lot of different views of the same type. We have lots of different round style text fields. And so when I look at this constraint and it says round style text field leading, I don't really know which one that, that belongs to. I can select this item in the document outline or in the editor. And in the identity inspector, if I give that element a label, say this is the first name text field, now it changes the name of that in the document outline, but it also changes the constraints that relate to that view, and it uses that name instead of just the generic name that we had before. So now I can see this is the first name text field baseline is equal to the first name baseline. Right now, all of our constraints in the document outline are under the same constraints header, but constraints get created on the first view that is common to both the views that are involved in the constraint. So in each of these cases, if I have a constraint between this view and its super view, the first view that's common to it is the super view. Let's say for example, I had an explicit width constraint on this text field. The first view that's common to this text field in itself is the text field. So it creates the constraint in that first view, that width constraint gets created in the first view that's common to both the views in the, involved in the constraint. So you're not always gonna see all, all of your constraints under the same group. Okay, let's undo that. If I go back to that trailing space constraint, we can see we talked about the first item and the second item in the constraint. Those menus both look the same. And we'll talk about relation in a, in a later tutorial. The constant is the distance of the constraint, and you saw we changed that to 20. Let's just change that back to zero, and you see the, the fields update to match that. We'll also talk about 
priority and multiplier later, but you can change those here. Let's talk about identifier. When you're dealing with constraints in the debug log or in code, sometimes it's helpful to have an identifier on the constraint so you can tell which constraint is which, and so you can enter that here. We'll also talk about placeholder constraints a, li a little bit later, but this allows you to select a constraint in Interface Builder that's gonna be removed at build time. And the main reason that you would use this is you don't wanna see any warnings or errors in your storyboard. And so if you have a constraint maybe that you're gonna add at runtime or something's gonna change at runtime to make a layout valid, but you just need to get rid of a warning or an error when you're an interface builder, then you might add a constraint and mark it to be removed at build time. The installed checkbox really comes into play with adaptive layouts. For more on that, see the adaptive layout video tutorial series. If you want to delete a constraint, if you select the constraint in the size inspector, let's just pick the leading space constraint, and you press the delete key, you might think that the constraint has been deleted. And again, this pertains to adaptive layout, so you'll want to see more on that. But you can see over here in the outline, in the, in the document outline, that the constraint's still there, it's just grayed out. If you really want to delete it, you need to select it either in the editor or in the document outline and press delete. We've deleted the leading space constraint on this text field. So of course we would expect that this text field now has a warning. We, we removed one of the constraints that it needs so it doesn't really know where to lay out. But what you might not expect is that the rest of these text fields are also showing warnings now. I just wanted to point out that sometimes when you're seeing a warning in the editor, it's not necessarily because of something that's missing or you have too many constraints on the view that you have selected. It may be that there's a problem with one of the views that it is constrained to. In this case, each of these text fields are constrained to the leading edge and the trailing edge of this top text field and because it has a warning, then they all have warnings as well. Let's go ahead and undo that delete. Now, if we want to modify constraint in code, we have to create an outlet between that constraint and a variable in code so that we can reference that constraint in code. Let's just open our assistant editor and give ourselves some room here. Let's say I want the leading space of this last name label to be indented from the first name label, but I don't really know how much I want it to be indented by at design time, and so I want to change that value at runtime. I can just control drag from the constraint itself into my code. We'll create an outlet and we'll call this indent constraint. And then at runtime, we'll set the constant of that constraint. If we build and run, you can see that it has now edited that constraint to have an indentation from the first name label. Well, that's it for this video tutorial. As always, we'd like to leave you with a challenge. For this challenge, you're gonna create this app that lists some of the employees of Razor. When you tap on the image of the employee, it grows larger and displays information about that employee in text below the images. All the details are in the challenge document. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.